We want to welcome everybody out to a uh, new networking lunch for the for this month. Uh, thank you for everybody that's came out today. Uh, we have food that's provided by the Italian place, so we want you to go and get you get food and get started to right now. Uh, we've got a good speaker. Uh, we've got Jan Hunt from uh, from the Department of Workforce Services, and she's going to talk about independent. Uh, independent contracting like insurance claims. We'll turn the time over to Jan. Um, I have uh, given you guys all a copy of the independent contractor statute for the unemployment insurance. As a field auditor, that is what we have the most problem with with employers in the state of Utah. Uh, they, even accountants, employment attorneys, they are unaware that there are laws that they have to follow before they hire an independent contractor. So if you take a look at what I, what I gave you, I'll, I also gave you a couple party favors too, some um, telephone numbers that you might need in the future for other agencies and a neat little magnet that um, they're, they provided us in Salt Lake. So please get rid of them because it's getting late in the year. So before you hire someone, make sure that you consider the uh, factors for determining independent contractors. There's, there's two factors, A and B. A, they have to be independently established in a business of the same nature as what they're performing. So for example, they have, uh, they're performing IT, but they have a hardwood floor company, not going to work. It has to be a business of the same nature. Their intent has to be they're in business not a side job to supplement their income. There's a big difference. Second part is, are they under your control and direction? So, for example, do they have supervision, training, etc.? So the first part, independently established. If you hire someone and you cannot prove that they're independently established because the burden of proof is on you guys as the employer. Oh, okay. Yeah, loud, I don't have a problem with <laughs> Okay, so if you hire someone and we come in and do an audit or an investigation and you cannot prove that this individual is independently established, usually we show them as a misclassified worker and they go on your, the wages, the payments that you have paid them goes on your, your account as wages. You pay the tax, you go on, however, if you, know, if you get a couple of investigations where somebody files a claim and you've hired someone, paid them cash, they have a full-time job elsewhere. They get laid off from that full-time job. They'll go down and apply for benefits, which you know, they're eligible for. But when they apply for benefits, they put down every single payment they've received, not just wages. Because the more payments they put down, the more benefits they take home. So you paid them cash, check, straight across the board, they're going to put those payments down. It goes up to claims. Claims is like, oh, we don't show these wages. So we in field, field audit get what is called a claims investigation. So we get a hold of the person, hey, do you have your own business? No. We get a hold of the employer, hey, do they have their own business? Uh, well, we don't know. So then we show, you know, those payments as wages, you pay the tax. Of course, you do have appeal rights too. There's two ways to appeal that. First, you appeal whether or not they're an employee. You can appeal our field audit decision, or you can appeal, uh, appeal the separation decision. So as employers, you still have rights. So but you get a couple of investigations, you're going to get an audit. Most audits are total at random. The computer picks the numbers, so don't think you're getting picked on. So when you hire someone, make sure that because the burden of proof is on you to prove that they are independent, make sure you have that proof. Contractors already know. They have to be registered with DOC. They have to have a contractor's license, workers' comp, general liability. Um, some, you know, a lot of the times with contractors, we don't have a problem, but a lot of times we do. So the following factors, and it all depends on the services they're performing on whether the factors, you know, the weight of each one of these factors. For example, first one, separate place of business. Do they work on your premises? Do they have a separate place of business? Home offices count. I had one guy, his car was his place of business. 
do they, and by having a place of business too, a lot of times we have people that, oh, I have a, you know, they have businesses, but they have an unlisted phone number. So if they actually had a business, they would hold themselves out to the public, hey, I'm doing book work or I'm doing whatever. Um, there has to be a way for clients, potential clients, to get in touch with them. So do they have a place of business, a separate place of business? Do they use their own tools and equipment? Now, tools and equipment is pretty important. Contractors, um, we have what is called tools of the trade. It all depends on the investment in those tools. Usually carpenters, they'll have hammers, uh, things like that. Where uh, if you're a cameraman, you may have your own camera. You know, it all depends on the investment in the tools of the trade. A lot of times if they're working out of their home, they already have a home computer. They have a telephone, they have internet. Those, the courts don't consider those tools of the trade. Uh, other clients, do they work for other people? If they only have one client, usually that means, you know, it, it means that their entire existence depends upon business with that one employer. I, I audited a company where they had, uh, they did social work for the state. And they hired social workers, um, psychologists part time to work on this contract for um, the state. However, these, these other psychologists and social workers had full time jobs elsewhere. So, you get a hold of them, oh, this is just a side job. No, I don't have a business. However, two of them did. They had businesses, they had business licenses, they even had accounts with us. They were paying themselves wages. But when you looked at the business relationship, this company was their only client. They worked on premises. The one guy was on salary. He worked 40 hours a week. So, no, they weren't independent. Um, so we just brought the principals in and showed them as employees. And the employer agreed with that. So, but you know, and then other times, you'll have a part-time mom, this is the only client I want. So it all depends on the, the weight of each, you know, each factor. Advertising, uh, do they advertise? Are they online, KSL, Google, Manta, local telephone directories, business cards? No, business cards are kind of iffy. So if you have a business card, so you have a salon worker, we have problems with salons where they hire hairstylists, nail techs, and these women have business cards with their name on them, but the name is also, the salon's name is also on the business card. The courts do not consider that advertising for that worker, they consider it advertising for the salon. So usually, you know, if I Google a small sole proprietor, I can find them online. A lot of times. Profit and loss. Um, another, oh, just for an example, salon workers. Okay, you pay me 40% commission, um, I'll use that as your booth rent. No chance for profit and loss because if they don't work, they're not paying rent. And as business owners, you know, if you don't go into the office, you're still paying rent that month. So, you know, they have to, there has to be overhead. Licenses, this is, this is a good one. Do they have a business license? Do they have a contractor's license? Um, a lot of times, like physical therapists, anytime you have a job description with the word assistant in it, you know, they're uh, an employee. Physical therapist assistants, <laughs> those are fun. Um, well, they have their own license. Well, yeah, they have to have a license in order to uh, do physical therapy, but because of the word assistant is in there, you have to supervise them. They have to have supervision. They cannot be independent. Interns, um, we have a lot of companies that uh, hire interns and pay them, but they, they pay them as independent contractors. Well, they're temporary employees. Okay, then pay them as an employee. And there's also no such thing as a 1099 employee. We get that a lot. Business records, a lot of times I'll be interviewing someone, and it's like, hey, uh, do you file a federal business income tax return? I don't know, my accountant handles that. Excuse me? Do you know what your accountant is putting in your income tax return? Because you are the one responsible for that. Do you know what you file? And so many times, we, we just get a blank look. 
Um, so obviously that tells you, you know, their intent is not to be in business. Okay, so if you have someone that, okay, yeah, we, you know, we can say that they may or may not be independent. Then you look at the control and direction factor. Oh, and guys, interrupt me. If you have questions, just yell. Okay, when an employer has a right to control and direct the performance of the service, that brings them into employment. Uh, we have individuals that go up to, you know, they go to employers, hey, um, I'd like to work for you. Okay, go start a business. Okay, that's control and direction. Um, or it, contracts. Contracts are really fun. Guys, watch your subcontracts because a lot of times those contracts bring them into employment of the control and direction factor. Uh, just for example, dance studios, love these. Okay, we will let you work for us as an independent contractor, but you can't work for anybody else. So any type of non-compete clauses can bring them into employment because you're taking away their right to make a living. Uh, you cannot choreograph or teach for any other dance studios within 40 miles. Um, it, you, that brings them right into employment under the control and direction factor. Um, my favorite, uh, if you're working for me and you develop anything that's patentable or can have a trademark or copyrighted, it belongs to me. That is definite control and direction. That brings them automatically into employment. Um, so, you know, your subcontracts, if they have to follow your policies and procedures. When you hire a plumber, he's going to tell you what time he's going to be there. He comes in, he fixes it, he gives you an invoice, he leaves. Okay, what happens if he doesn't fix it correctly and your floor is flooded? His general liability will fix that. His insurance. If he falls on the way out the door and breaks his arm, his workers' comp covers that. If you're hiring independent contractors and they don't have insurances, guess who's responsible for damages and injuries? You can be sued or you're paying out of pocket. So uh, it's really, you know, your risk factor is enormous if you hire someone as an independent contractor and they don't have the right insurances. Instructions. Do you have to tell them what to do, when to do it, how to do it? Um, on the job training, this is what we want you to do. Um, so training or instructions, following in instructions, uh, Having a supervisor, having them, uh, you know, you have to do what I say when I say it type deal. Instead of like the plumber, he comes in, does his job, he leaves. Training. Um, usually when you hire an independent contractor, you're hiring someone for their skill set. If you have to train them, um, other than, you know, hey, um, this is what we want you to do, and then they do it. But if you're giving them on-the-job training or requiring training, that's another indication that they're misclassified. Pace or sequence. This one is, um, it's a set routine. They're doing the same thing over and over and over and over. They come in Monday through Friday, uh, 9 to 5. They're filing. You know, there's the pace or sequence also can determine whether or not they're independent. Work on employer premises, this is a biggie one too. Some of these, like I said, have more weight than others because you're hiring some for their, someone for their skill set and they come to your place to work. Um, it all depends on the job they're doing. Sometimes you may have the only computer with the software that you know they can send messages on or whatever. So it, but normally if they're on your premises, that gives you the right to supervise them. Personal service, you hire someone, if you hire the plumber, she, he, can, he can send his son as long as his son can do the job. But if you require someone, you have to do it, no one else can do it. <coughs> Continuous relationship, this one's fun too. Have someone, they hire someone three years ago, they're paying them every week or every other week um, for three years. Yeah, 
that's a continuous relationship. Normally, if you hire a subcontractor or an independent contractor, they're in and out. It's like a project here, a project there. There's no continuous relationship. Set hours of work. You don't tell them, hey, you got to be here 9 to 5. You can tell them, our operating hours are, can you do your project or whatever between these hours? But, you know, you, uh, if you hire, we have a lot of people, they hire the neighbor's daughter while the receptionist is out on maternity leave. So she's on premises, she's working a set schedule, but they're paying her as an independent contractor. Method of payment. An accountant the other day tried to tell me that some time cards were actually invoices. Um, and contractors know that if you hire a contractor or sub, they're going to give you uh, a proposal, a bid. Um, or they're going to say, I will do it. It may take this many hours, this much an hour. If you're telling them, this is what I'm going to pay, and these are the hours you're going to work, uh, that's big time control and direction. So, guys got questions. You've been too quiet. Oh, and I'm like Vegas. You can ask me anything. It stays with me. I've been hearing about this. I'm a chiropractor, so we hear a lot of times from massage therapists, you gotta be careful, you can't you get them at the 1099 unless you are willing to, to not have that control, which we, you were just talking about. Um, which is, I hired mine as W2 employees because of that guidance that I got. And description-wise, it sounds like I could do it, but it would be a real headache to do a 1099 massage therapist. We have a lot of problems with spas uh, and massage therapists. Okay, if you have a massage therapist that she has a separate place of business, her own home, or you know she's out there, she's on KSL.com, or she advertises on the internet, obviously she has to have a license. Um, if she rents a room from you and you have nothing to do with it after that, you don't tell her she has to clean her room, you don't tell her she has to wear your uniform, anything like that. Yeah, massage therapists, it all depends on what evidence you have that she's independent. You don't set her schedule. Uh, she has her own clients. She doesn't use your visa machine. Uh, there's a lot of factors in that. If the clients are your clients and she is um, uh, massaging your clients, not her own, then yeah, she's definitely an employee. So, and it's, it's safe. You know, you, your risk factor isn't up here that you have someone that's not insured on your premises. So, any other questions? Yeah. What's the benefit of doing a 1099 versus an employee in a situation? Why would it be preferable? Uh, well, if you can prove, like I said, if you can prove that they are independently established in a business of the same nature and they're free from your control and direction, you're good. Um, the, I, the federal government compares the 1099s to state unemployment insurance accounts at the end of the year. Okay. And um, it's like, you know, they, they really keep them in the state. They keep a close eye on those 1099s. So to reiterate, it's best to have an employee if possible than 1099 only in certain circumstances? If they don't meet the state statute. If they don't meet the state statute for independence, the ones that I set here, they're an employee. But you, like I said, you've got to watch your risk factor too. Because the burden of proof is on you, not the employee. They can come to you and say, treat me as an independent contractor. Oh, okay, I saved my payroll burden. 10, 12%, whatever your burden is. You treat them like that, guaranteed, at the end of one or two years or whenever they're let go or they quit, they will file for benefits. And you will be the one ending up paying because they don't have a business, even though they're the ones that requested it. That happens a lot. Well, they told me he was, you know, he told me he was independent. What's your proof? Okay. You know, we have employers that require this copies of business licenses. They require, you know, there's a lot of stuff they require just for their, um, their personnel or their uh, AP files. So uh, questionnaires, things like that. Uh, especially a lot of companies that do e-commerce, um, 
They do a lot of things on the internet, a lot of coding, things like that. So you really got to watch that. So what happens if an employer hires an independent contractor, and they're not, and they're an employee, and they go file for benefits, when they get audited, taken through that? You're basically, what happens is when we come in and we do an investigation or an audit, uh, let's say an audit. Our audit system is separate from the state system, the state UI system. So when we finish the audit, the um, audit is approved. What happens is that wage information, the name, social security number, quarterly wages, is downloaded into your state account as an amended return. Mm -hmm. And um, you get a bill for each quarter. And but like I said, we're yeah. Even though for one year, two years, right, right, and benefits go back six quarters. So, um, but you get penalized. You know, you do get penalized if you're a first-time employer and you've never filed reports before. But normally, as a first-time employer, because you don't know any better, a lot of times we they waive that penalty. So it's just the actual tax and the interest, and the interest is federally mandated. We can't do anything about that. So, yeah. So it sounds like it's pretty subjective, and it can go either way, just depending on the person who's looking at it. Is that how it goes? No, it depends on the services and what evidence you have. Normally, um, there's evidence out there that shows that they're independent. Okay, you have a registration with Department of Commerce. Um, you can ch and anybody can check those registrations on DOC. Um, under the Labor Commission, you can also check workers' comp certificates online. Um, Google, look Google. The, uh, just put the name of the company in or the name of the individual and the city and state. If they have a business, bam, it usually just pops up. A lot of the cities too have their business licenses online. Uh, Orm City, you just type in the name and it tells you if they have one. Uh, there's a couple of cities that I would really like to meet with their programmers because it's like, oh, okay, this, they have, they have it according to when the business license was issued. That doesn't tell us anything. I don't know when, if they have a business license, we need them in alphabetical order or s we need them in order where we can sort by address, things like that. Uh, a lot of times with those cities, we just call. I'm first name basis with a lot of city recorders too and I love the small cities. They know everything about everybody. So is there like, you know, you have to have so many of these out of, you have to have seven out of 10? Like I said, it, there a rule there? it depends on the services. Some of them have more weight than others. Um, but yeah, usually uh, these factors, you know, if you go down the factors, then you'll be good. So it, it, we don't make just arbitrary decisions. We have to have evidence. And lack of evidence is evidence also. We don't, we don't just assume or make up our minds. We have to have the evidence. So, and like I said, and a lot of times we can, we can find them, find the evidence online for the employer. You know, contractor's licenses, real estate licenses, uh, insurance licenses, things like that. It's all online, like workers' comp, um, and especially Department of Commerce. Anything else? And, it, and you guys can ask me questions afterwards, too. Is there a certain dollar value that will no. be paid? No, one hour. Yeah, any type of service. We have a lot of employers. Oh, I love this accountant out in Emory County. It's under 600 bucks. You don't have to report it. <laughs> yeah, you do. So uh, if it's under 600 bucks, that means you don't have to issue a 1099. But if they're performing services, yeah, you have to report them as employees if they don't meet the state statute. And um, we, have a, we have some issues with sales too. Um, car lots, I don't get this one. Sales is it's, um, if you have a salesman, an outside sales, the, the statute states they can be exempt from UI if, and there's, there's um, Four factors. One, they don't have uh, any type of investment in the company. They work off premises. You know, they can come in, maybe give you a sales order. Um, they are paid 100% commission, and this is a big one because we have a lot of door to door companies that they define commission as a flat fee. 
Utah defines a commission as a percentage of sales or volume. It has to be a percentage, and you can't change that percentage. Like, well, I want to give them $100 for each sale, so it doesn't matter the size of the sale. We're going to do this percentage, this percentage, this percentage. Still a flat fee. And the fourth one is a real biggie because I've won some appeals on this one because um, they don't look this up, attorneys and accountants. The statute says it cannot be employment at common law, the fourth factor. But they don't look up common law. Common law means control and direction. So if you have a salesman, yeah, they're going door to door. They are, um, they don't work on your premises. They're, but they have to wear your uniform. You tell them you have to work from noon till dusk. You take more than two days off, we're fining you $450 or you can lose all the commission that you've earned. Um, you know, that control and direction factor is enormous. And that brings them into employment. So. So that last time, I can just leave them up to their own hour, and their own shift. They don't have to wear a uniform. If they're completely independent and they can work for you and your competitor, and believe it or not, we, I have had salesmen do that. Well, they're working for both companies at the same time. But you don't tell them, you can't work for this guy. You have to do it this way. You have to do it. There's no control and direction there. But they're selling for you. You pay them a commission based on the sale, a percentage of that sale. Um, they don't work on your premises. You're good. So an example of this would be somebody working for DirecTV and Dish Network both. Mm -hmm. Like they they sell both of them. Yeah, you you can't tell your salesman who they can work for, or what products they can sell. So if they're selling for you, and then uh, they're selling one product for you, but then they're selling another another product for someone else. I mean, as long as they're selling for you and making you money, you should. Yeah. What what about this control and direction with training? Because I think that sometimes you get confused. I mean, think about the salespeople. You have training, and you want them to train. You want to train them to sell your product in the right way, but at the same time, you don't want to give them the control and direction. Can you? Because to me, that seems a little great. Can you define that a little bit? With if training you have a yeah, if you have a salesman and he wants to sell for you, you send him out with another salesman. You're not paying him. Um, if he makes sales in the state of Utah and he's paid 100% commission, and that's all he earns, that's another caveat with salesmen. You can't pay them bonuses, you can't pay vacation, you can't pay insurance, it has to be 100% commission, that's it. <coughs> Nothing else, because you pay them anything else, that brings them right into employment. Um, but you so, can train them on how But you can sell. train them on, you know, we have some it's companies, the yeah, they, they'll go out with another salesman. This is how I do it, and then if, when they start making sales, then, and you pay them that commission, they're still outside sales. So a little bit of training, you know, this is just the way that this is done. But. Yeah, you gotta watch that. A lot of the door-to-door -door companies send kids out for training in Utah, but they don't pay them for it, then they send them out of state. Or if they make sales in Utah then they treat them as employees. So, anything else? Gosh, you guys are quiet. You haven't even thrown anything at me yet. I'm like, oh, an auditor. Ugh. Okay, well, it, um, I can give anybody my cell number if you uh, have anything additional that you want to talk about or if you have any questions on um, nonprofits, interns, anything, give me a call. Thanks, guys.